Today, Maria Bukur, the John W. H. Chair of East European History and Professor of the Department of History at the Indiana University, and I are going to explore the relationships between feminism and democracy, fo focusing on her examination of gender studies in Romania. I'm happy to say that Maria is my friend and colleague in the Democracy Seminar of the New School's Transregional Center for Democratic Studies, the sponsor of today's event. She's an active member of our worldwide committee of democratic correspondence. Bukor is the John V. I said that already. Okay. She is the author of six books and over 40 articles on recent history of Romania and gender relations. She has published on eugenics, war and memory, citizenship under communism, gender violence, modernism, feminism, and has recently completed a book, I don't know how recently, uh, about veterans administration in interwar Romania. Uh, she was born in Romania and came to the United States and pursued her higher studies at, uh, uh, and her career in the United States. Uh, she came here at, at the age of 18. My name is Jeffrey Goldfog. I am the Michael E. Gellert Professor of Sociology at the New School for Social Research and Chair of the Democracy Seminar. I've published many books and articles, including a provocatively titled essay I wrote in dialogue with the distinguished feminist Anne Snittel, essay entitled, Why Is There No Feminism After Communism? I should add that the title derives from the classic long debates on why is there no socialism in America? I think that that's misleading. Before we proceed, the Democracy Seminar's program manager, Lala Pop, will make a few remarks about the rules of the game of this webinar session. Lala. Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. Um, I just wanted to point out that the webinar is being recorded and we're also live streaming on Facebook. Um, so your questions that will be read out loud will be also recorded and streamed on Facebook. Um, speaking of questions, in the Q&A section at the bottom of the screen, you can uh, place your questions. And in the second part of the event, we will um, respond and um, discuss the questions. So please feel free to ask questions. You can also ask them anonymously. Um, also keep an eye on the chat. I will be sharing some links for the Democracy Seminar for our upcoming events, and also the links to where the video of this event will be posted after the event. Um, enjoy and have a great discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Lava. Uh, Maria, when I think of the relationship between feminism and democracy, I think of two analytically distinct but related issues. The relationships between gender justice and injustice and democratic practices on the one hand, and on the other, the way these relationships are accounted for by more or less illuminating theories and by ideologies. So how would you summarize these dimensions in Romania, uh, perhaps also among its neighbors and beyond? Is there any good news? And what's the bad news? All right, well, so first of all, I just want to thank uh, Jeff for inviting me uh, for this discussion. I always relish uh, any conversation I have with you. I feel like I learn a lot. And I wanna thank Lala for taking care of us uh, all the way from Satu Mare in Romania. I think that's very appropriate for the conversation we're having today. Um, so let me dive right in, in terms of what's the good news and what's the not so good news about gender studies and feminism in Romania. Um, and I really uh, think that we need to focus um, since you already introduced it um, in terms of post-communism on the period that started after 1989. Um, it's very clear that, you know, if you look at 1989 as uh, year zero of um, a kind of um, flourishing 
possible flourishing of democracy in Eastern Europe, um, feminism is not something that stands out as uh, an early development um, that had any significant purchase in either theoretical or in political uh, sort of uh, milieus uh, in Romania. The building of civil society um, as it was sort of coming into being um, in the 1980s very furtively, and maybe we can go back there a bit later, but starting to really develop in the early 90s <clears throat> was really focused in Romania on the uh, specific articulations of communism in one family, which is in a way unique to Romania in relation to other communist countries. So uh, the hatred of Nicolae Ceausescu was entwined with the hatred, even greater hatred of Elena Ceausescu. I, I can tell you that in December, 1989, on the 25th, when I woke up in the morning and I saw the video of Elena Ceausescu and Nicolae Ceausescu looking at their watches, waiting to be rescued and then being shot uh, unceremoniously by this kangaroo court that was put together. The reaction that many people had was almost more negative uh, in terms of seeing Elena Ceausescu than Nicolae Ceausescu. So what I want to say is that there was a um, script in Romania in terms of women's participation in politics and women's power in the public sphere. It was very much identified with the hatred for Elena Ceausescu. And so the script went something like this. Um, because Elena Ceausescu um, is the kind of um, the exemplar of women in politics in Romania, Everybody else that we're seeing in the Central Committee or as ministers of, at that point, basically the Minister of Education uh, was a woman. I mean, it's not like there was a lot of representation of women, P.S. Uh, the membership was far lesser than with men throughout the communist period and women didn't make it to the top. That's another topic, we can go back there. But point is, all these women became identified with this image of Elena Ceausescu who made it where she made it because of her husband, who was illiterate, who had gotten a PhD because of corruption. In short, let's kick women out of politics because uh, we cannot trust these people because look at how corrupt they are, right? So, so the kind of double standard that we see in other places with regard to gender representation in politics is very present there, but with a flavor that is very particular to Romania's history and that, that negative image of Elena Ceausescu, right? So the fact that, in fact, there had been some really powerful um, female writers who were writing very critically about the communist regime uh, was not something that stood out as uh, something to celebrate among the dissidents. If you think about the dissidents in Romania, there's one woman that stands up, Doina Corne, who was um, a, a basically a peaceful, you know, anti-government, uh, so truth to power speaker, right? Um, but other ways in which women participate as dissidents and in the making of civil society were not really brought to, to the fore. And I can tell you that today, because I've, I've been looking at this as I work on gender uh, analysis, if you look at how history textbooks are presented today about what happened around 89 and afterwards, it's Doina Corna. Uh, she's one of the few women that appears as any kind of positive character, uh, heroic character, in the entire history of Romania. Mm -hmm. There's like maybe three others, right? So, so this is to speak about the kind of space that um, knowledge makers have made for women or for women-centered types of um, participation in civil society and in politics um, in the early period of the 1990s. Um, the good news, that was like the not so good news. <laughs> right? okay. I, I think there's some worse news if, if I understand what's going on there, but it's an introduction, introduction to the not so good news. Right. Um, I'm, I'm just kind of layering the foundation of where, where this is coming from. Um, but the, the, the somewhat better news is that um, out of the 
I want to say invisibilization, but that's not a real word. Um, out of this process of rendering women invisible because of this lack of a trust based on what I just said about Elena Ceausescu. Um, by the mid 90s, so that's five years in the, the transition period, there were enough um, intellectuals, um, artists, journalists, but really academics more, philosophers, uh, literary critics, historians, who started to simply ask, you know, what, what's going on? We know that there is a history to feminism. We know that there are women who did things in the past. And we know that there's a lot of women today that have enormous energies they can offer. And somehow nobody's paying attention to this. And so uh, I will say we, because I was in Romania at that time and I was starting to work on these issues and think about them. We started to read um, Western feminist, mostly liberal, um, there was um, allergy to Marxism uh, right. at that time. Uh, there wasn't Which I so wrote much, about. A, right? There yes. isn't so much anymore. I think generationally we're in a different place, mm. and yeah. people have a different relationship with that past. And uh, but at that time, it was primarily liberal. Uh, you know, so John Stuart Mill. Uh, you know, uh, Wollstonecraft. I mean, things like you know, like that. Um, but of course, Mary Daly was also something that people, you know, uh, started to read. So, taking those ideas um, and really with a focus on the kind of individual, an individual sense of autonomy, right, as 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 the core issue, the sense of creating a room of our own and a space in which we could be recognized and appreciated and, and valued in a true sense um, is where that came from. Um, it did not materialize in any kind of political movement at that time. What it materialized in, and this is where the good news is, I, I am building the good news, is the formation of several uh, programs that focused on feminist theory, and then that morphed into gender studies. At that time, the use of the word gender, of course, was still kind of coming into being, not in this country, but in terms, the word did not exist, right? It had grammatical meaning, but not cultural, political, social, uh, social meaning. Um, and so uh, in Bucharest at the School for National, um, <laughs> sorry, Political Studies and Political Administration uh, in Bucharest and uh, University of Bucharest and then University of Babes Boyai um, in Cluj, uh, three different, you know, passionate, uh, one anthropologist, one political scientist and one philosopher, all women uh, created programs that were master's programs and then became PhD concentrations in this area. And so the good news numerically is that by now there's over 350 master's students that have graduated from this and over something like 100 PhDs it, with some you know, interest or focus on feminist theory or gender studies. So there is now a field of knowledge making in Romania that self-identifies as gender studies that has predominantly a feminist perspective not just liberal, there's now a lot of uh, interest in Marxist and queer theory with a Marxist flavor. Um, and uh, overall, there's you know uh, enough research that's been done and knowledge that has been accumulated to suggest um, that this, these theories are being taken very seriously. Um, the real problem is that the translation of such ideas and the kind of uh, problems that they illustrate uh, into policymaking, into political platforms for mobilizing people and 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 you know coming up with solutions for real like domestic violence, you know problems like that, um, is not really gaining purchase to the extent mm -hmm. that I think is required to make some significant progress for some of these problems. So, so I, 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 that's an interesting account, and it, it, it strikes me that this is actually a similar, it's a variation on a theme, but, but the theme is uh, it, uh, one that uh, was reveal, revealed throughout the for, you know, Central Europe, the former Soviet bloc, that, that, that uh, immediately after 1989, um, um, feminism was... Uh, um, as, as an idea uh, in the mainstream was taken uh, in some ways as a joke 
or as something that didn't translate into um, everyday experience of women or men. You know that 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 it would it the language of it was uh, hard to translate, uh, though the need to translate it was clear and present. The the, the ability to kind of deal with uh, the experience of women and men in uh, um, uh, society and the and the existence of not only already existing gender injustice but heightening gender injustice. That wasn't uh, feminism uh, didn't provide an immediate, easy uh, um, um, uh, instrument to uh, understand that. And that's the essay I wrote really yeah. was about that, about the, 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 the on the one hand, in, you know, uh, you, I introduced you as being uh, born in Romania. Uh, 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 moving to the United States when you're 18, having your professional career in the United States. I'm born in the United States, uh, but in the early 1970s, I started uh, adopting a the country of Poland, and I've been a long time observer of Polish uh, po uh, culture and politics uh, there, and, and, uh, and particularly a chronicler of the emergence of a democratic opposition and then a democratic alternative in Poland. And, and I, I was uh, uh, struck by the, uh, you know, it, after 1989, the, the uh, um, you know, the same pattern that you observed. And in, in some ways even worse, because mm -hmm. there were prominent, mm -hmm. prominent heroic women mm -hmm. who were absolutely central to the development of solidarity. And, uh, after 1989, they were systematically written out of the history. So, so, it, 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 so you have it there. You want to show? Well, show, I show. wanted to show you that in my book, The Century of Women. I don't know if you yeah. can see this, but there's two women on the front, yeah. right? And and the one at the bottom is. Do you do you see this picture? I, I don't. It's, yeah. it's Anna Valentinovich. Oh, oh, well, it's, yes. it's the heroine that we're talking about. Yeah. Yes. But. Um, uh, 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 you know, the the actual editor of Gazeta Vyborcza over years was uh, um, Helena Wuchivo, and uh, she was the editor of the kind of underground Solidarity Weekly, uh, and and uh, and there there were uh, um, kind of oppositionist figures who. who Used men's name, but they were uh, they were women, and and the, the kind of the, the account of that. Uh, I mean, it was it was not just a, an individual hero; it was a deeply uh, 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 developed uh, op uh, role that women played in in the development of uh, the opposition in Poland before 1989, and then after 1989, they they were, as you said disappeared <laughs> you know uh, uh may, not not visible but then on the other hand uh recognizing that injustice and then actually uh the heightened problems that women were facing in the uh, post-communist period uh did lead to a need to understand and and i think throughout the block former block um, um, gender studies and feminism uh, developed um, um, kind of a, a local a vernacular uh, and drawing upon various uh, 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 traditions from around the world, but actually also developing on its own and, and flourishing of gender studies um, uh, as you described it in Romania. So, so yeah. that, that's really, I think something that's the baseline. And, and I think the good news is actually that that developed and it developed power. The bad news is that there's a reaction to it. And I, th I think right. that's, the, that's the next uh, uh, part of the story. So, so I, I, yeah. I, I, that I'd like to hear you talk about this whole idea of gender ideology as right. being sort of the new communist, you know, the new uh, uh, communist enemy or something of that sort. Right, and of course, so much has been written about that in 
Poland as well. My friend Agnieszka Graf has, has, has right. done quite a bit and there's many others who've written about it as well. And so she's in part my inspiration for mm -hmm. how I think mm -hmm. about it to be perfectly honest. Um, yeah, so this interesting, um, very early on, in fact, reaction to uh, the development of a feminist discourse and the language that you're talking vocabulary, right? Um, you see, uh, even, you know, in the article that you shared with me, and I remember very well from the, you know, the second half of the 90s, uh, this trope, the stereotype of the man-hating feminist who is here to emasculate men and defeminize women um, and looks a lot like a Stalinist apparatchik. Mm -hmm. So so there was the trope of overlaying, you know, something that was clearly as it was developing then, you know, inspired by Western feminism, right? And to overlay that with not yet the language of political correctness mm -hmm. or cancel culture, but but where you know the ugly woman who is also like a babushka and your crazy kagebe uh you know informer or apparatchik was already to some extent present right, right. um but it was the issue was back then that in fact the presence of any kind of feminist positioning was not all that prominent in, right. in public discourse so so it was on the margins and it was kind of like a ha ha cute funny you know just good old misogyny um and then as romania so and i'm going to talk about romania very directly here sure as romania started to contemplate what it would take for it to become part of the eu because that's really important I think in terms of thinking about transitioning to this new phase. Um, it realized that gender mainstreaming, because we're talking about the early 2000s at this point, right? Gender mm -hmm. mainstreaming was at that point, a core component of how Romanian lawmakers, institution builders needed to think about um, legislation, policies, programs, training of public, uh, you know, uh, office holders of the law enforcement, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so uh, we end up with a mishmash in the early 2000s of people hurrying to write into law, to write into regulations, all sorts of wording about gender parity or gender representation. Um, in most of these cases, the people doing the work, the people um, being appointed to be on the chair of you know, whatever committee was being appointed to deal with this in parliament, senate, and the government, yeah, yeah, were people who had never studied gender studies, who like were not feminist, 100% not feminist, and who were about 90% not women also. Mm -hmm. That's the situation in like 2003, 2004, right? Yes. So my friend Mihaela Miroyu, who is the most prominent feminist in Romania and who basically created the first feminist studies program. And it's just, you know, she, she worked really hard to try to put together ways to train people to do gender mainstreaming. Right. She was never appointed to any of these positions ever. Right. And when several of her students were extremely competent, tried to compete for these in an open competition and with, incredible CVs compared to other people. I mean, I, I looked at the CVs because they're public, you know, thing, knowledge of the National Council to Fight Discrimination. Not a single person in that group has any serious qualification in feminist theory or gender studies. They have almost nothing to do with gender justice. So what really started to happen is the kind of the pretense of doing gender mainstreaming, but without it, right? And so what you have is a reaction by feminists at that point saying, this is bullshit, pardon my French. This is not what we're trying to do here or, you know. So this in this process of increasing tension between pretending to do gender mainstreaming and being critiqued from inside, you have a revival of feminists are men haters. But now there's an added layer because by the period that we're talking about now, it's 2007, 2008. There's a global recession, unemployment's going up, 
uh, there's the migrant crisis that's starting to develop, right? Which grows and grows. So by 2012, now you have the Syrian refugee crisis as well, right? So Romania basically at this point has been doing some gender mainstreaming, but without really empowering women or engaging in really producing gender justice. Can I interrupt yeah. you just yeah, for please, a second there? Please. Yeah, I mean, yeah. You know, because I really, I want you to go to the next step, but I, yeah. I, I actually want to hear your account of why uh, if, if they were under um, the authorities, were under pressure yeah. to uh, uh, to gender mainstream, uh, to, to kind of include gender mm -hmm. uh, in, in their consideration. So that this is a positive. You know, these yes. days, you know, these weeks, we're all looking at the EU and saying, "What the hell? You know, why yeah. why can't you deal with this pandemic in a more sensible way?" It's yeah. something I feel dearly because of my family in Europe. Uh, 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 but you know, the EU is doing a good job at this moment. Uh, so, what keeps the authorities from actually uh, in, employing the real experts? Why do they uh, they use the these uh, kind of non expert? You know, these people who really don't have credentials and don't have capacity. Well, um, I so the the short version of it is that um, all the political parties in Romania after 1999, before so too, but now on the kind of free market of uh, political ideas are boys clubs, uh -huh. They're just boys clubs. Uh, the participation, so it's the proportion of elected women to parliament in Romania has gone down. Like it went down from 1989, down, 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 down. And at the, for instance, at the local municipal level, it's even worse than at the national level where it's, mm -hmm. it was like, 13% right. at that point, right? So that's, yeah, they yeah, don't so trust women. Uh, so, so for instance, when this issue of gender parity gets put on the table for the parties, mm. their way of dealing with it is to place female candidates on the lists in places where they're absolutely sure that, we, that they're gonna lose right. 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 as right. a way to, right? The Potemkin yeah, yeah. village of gender right. mainstreaming. Right. Um, the issue is that there are very few feminist politicians in Romania who are actually believe in you know systemic misogyny and who want to address it. You know, today Parliament people talk about women in dis disgusting ways and disrespectful ways uh and you know there's laws against it and and there's been criticism of politicians that are becoming more and more radically you know anti-women in in parliament and okay so people complain at the national council against discrimination and that's registered you know they take note of it and someone might get a little fine the end no, nothing changes mm -hmm. so the there hasn't been the political will in 30 years plus mm -hmm. to really engage with this issue in a serious fashion that's really the simple right. uh, and sad answer that i yeah. that i have yeah. to give um I'll say another thing is, uh, so one might ask, why are women getting more involved in politics? Why is this not something that they are pushing for themselves? Um, there are women. Um, they're not very supported by either their parties, whatever party they affiliate with, because of what I just told you about. Um, and other than that, it's really hard to get into politics as an independent politician. There are some like really good examples out there, you know, here and there. And I would say that there's more of a presentation of individual feminist um, politicians now in, uh, in parliament, like in the Senate, for instance, uh, than there had been 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. But it's not a groundswell by any right. stretch right. of the imagination. And the thing that I think is most important that we don't really talk about that much, but, but here it is, it's called time, mm -hmm. right? Uh, oh, right. If your, your you essay the, on time that you published in public seminar was really, really interesting. Uh, if you uh, have uh, time to <laughs> spend building your political following instead of cooking, cleaning, taking the kids to school, et cetera, et cetera, then you can do those things. Um, the relationship between how much time men and women spend at home doing unpaid labor has not gotten any smaller under communism or neoliberalism. Right. 
both have treated women equally in that regard, statistically speaking. So it's it's about that too. Um, and and you know, there's also this issue which I really like the way you put it in your essay. That uh, and I, I, I this is exactly our finding in the recent book that I wrote with Mihaila Miroyu about women under post communism, communism and post communism politics, which is um, it's fairly evident to us that women that grew up under state socialism um, in Romania, and it seems like in Poland as well, developed a relationship between self and like the public um, civic duty or politics or the state or however you want, the, the sense of citizenship is based not so much on, on demanding individual rights, demanding to be seen and demanding one's right. It's based on a relational, familiar set of circumstances and of understanding oneself as part of putting together solutions, problem solving. In other words, the, so we talked to a bunch of women who are not sort of highfalutin, they're from different you know, sort of areas of life, we did interviews with 101 women, uh, different generations also. And what they were saying was, you know, look, I just wanna know how I can help. What can I contribute? to solving problem as opposed to what can I get out of that? I, so I think that sort of positioning doesn't necessarily um, produce the kind of ambitious, uh, intensely driven politicians that make it to the top. Yeah. On the other hand, it, 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 from my point of view, it leads to a wiser political position. So, so that, that, that's a tragedy. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, um, you know, and one I think that we have to observe uh, as uh, historians and theor uh, theorists of democracy that, that, that uh, this kind of uh, uh, embodied, uh, connected uh, insight and wisdom and problem solving uh, makes democracy uh, uh, more just. On the other hand, it may make the people who engage in it less likely to uh, 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 be visible and to be prominent and be able to actually uh, command the political stage. Right. If competition is the rule and not cooperation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's the dynamic. I yeah. have to say that that, that I, I I follow it, but not in uh, in um, thoroughly and not systematically. But I I think that something that has happened in po Poland has taken in recent years has taken the next step that that, that the, the situation it, maybe it's because the situation of, of women is uh uh more and more threatened by the regime uh that there's more understanding on the part of women and men that actually addressing the problems of gender injustice uh is actually key to uh, uh pursuing a democratic future which is really light years away from where Poland was in 1989. You know, so, so, so that uh, the struggle for uh, against the regime is uh, women are playing a central role, uh, both uh, uh, as actors and also symbolically. So, so I, I, I think that's, that, that's uh, I mean, generally speaking, these days are, uh, uh, not very hopeful times, but this is uh, an extraordinarily uh, hopeful development. Is that possible in Romania? Do you see any of uh, the prospects for that in Romania? Um, it's hard to tell because uh, I don't, you know, follow every political iteration in Romania. I'll right, be perfectly right. honest. I'm a little yes. busy teaching right now. Um, the thing that I... Um, worry about with regard to gender studies or with you know this kind of gender justice positioning is that there are so many crises all the time from so many different areas um, brought about by corruption a lot but a variety of other negative developments that trying to keep attention on this and trying mm. to develop it from uh, just expressing um, an, an intent, expressing an aspiration to then building towards really uh, educating people and, and it presenting the actual results of this kind of involvement, you know, as, as, as visible and relevant is really hard to bring about. So I'll give you an example. So this issue that I was talking 
to you about in you know the thing that I sent you earlier, uh, which was that gender studies almost became illegal last year, and there was a half year struggle that went to the Supreme Court to uh, turn the stupid law as uh, is, is, you know unconstitutional. Um, so that took half a year and a lot of um, a lot of attention and a lot of effort by a lot of people. It was exhausting. The success of it in a way is great. What I was expecting, you know, this is in December when this happened, is, is some kind of like beyond the acknowledgement, okay, we can have gender studies. Next question, what is it good for? Mm. Is it just good because it's important to have academic freedom or what the hell do we do with this thing? What, right. what does it help us do? As soon as we're ready to get that point, the next crisis hit. And the next crisis is the rise of anti-Semitic speech among Romanian politicians that is becoming egregious. Mm -hmm. um, a few days ago was the commemoration of uh, the January pogrom of 1941, um, well, a few oh, months ago, um, of, uh, you know, that the, the legionary movement um, did against uh, the Jewish population of Bucharest. Mm -hmm. And this is occasion for people in parliament who are right wing to start celebrating legionary uh, so-called martyrs. So now the entire Romanian civil society is up in arms discussing anti-Semitism because that is the latest uh, crisis of more legitimacy, basically. Right. So this is what I'm afraid of, is the capacity of the media and civil society to sustain interest in this sort of issue, because I do think gender studies is not just about wrongs done, but exactly what you're saying, creating problem solving in a different way. I mean, right. you know, so I can imagine, you know, discussion in which when we start talking about anti-Semitism and racism, that gender studies actually has an important positive contribution to make to talking about discrimination on the basis of those issues, of those categories, you know, for instance. But I don't see that intersectional approach, which I think is really essential mm -hmm. to building allyship, to building, a, um, a, a sustaining, interest and, and focus, uh, yet really um, well articulated, well developed. That's, I think that, I think in Poland, uh, that has been done more effectively by yeah. feminist groups and organizations and networks with the LGBTQI, um, you know, growing networks that they're right. becoming more imbricated and, and doing good work together. Right, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, I, I, I think that's true. And, 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 you know, I have friends who, who have been uh, with their bodies, I think particularly of my friend, uh, Tomek Kitlinski, who um, um, is both uh, a political actor and a philosopher, uh, a feminist, a, a LGBTQ rights activist, and also very, very involved in fighting uh, the legacies of anti-Semitism in Poland. Um, well, so that a very moving um, uh, um, person and, and, and his activities are, are uh, commendable, um, highly commendable. Uh, um, just have to say that because you're reminding me of him, dear Thomas. Uh, um, I wanted, to, let's take a step back Mm -hmm. And uh, because I find it so peculiar, I think it would be interesting to understand uh, this thing that I need to understand better, what, what this anti-gender ideology right. is. Yes. Uh, because I find it, it extraordinarily peculiar, though uh, it's not like uh, I don't know something about it as an American, uh, you know, in the United States, but, it, but it, I think it's much more um, crystallized in Central Europe. Um, so um, I, I see a question here, uh, several questions in the chat. I'm, I'm keeping an eye on it as well. And I think what I'm going to say next, to some extent, it speaks to the second question from Anne Marie Getz. Um, You're good. So you, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, I, I'm not so good. <laughs> yes, yes. I, I confessed, you know, to the audience. I confessed to uh, Lala and Maria that I, that I'm not so good at that. And I asked Lala to to uh, uh, monitor the question and answer. But go, go, go. Yeah. Um, so anti-gender um, or the discourse of so-called gender ideology is something that um, has been developing for a while, but became particularly uh, visible 
starting in 2012 in this area. Um, and it basically combines localized, in the case of you know, Poland, Hungary, Russia, Romania, Bulgaria, you know, I can go on. Uh, Germany is another very important place and it's actually a leading place for, for the anti-gender uh, conceptualizations. Um, a kind of anxiety about globalization, uh, anxiety about immigration and the displacement of native people by immigrants who also happen to be not as white as the native. That doesn't happen. I'm, I'm being facetious, obviously. Oh, yeah. There's racism involved in that. Um, uh, a kind of grown distrust about the solutions that the West is providing because this is at a period of economic downturn, right? And some of the very serious um, limitations that the EU was posing at that time with regard to certain kinds of development and access to resources, if we remember correctly, right? So, so all these things are factors from the outside, uh, together with the unfortunate timing of um, the growth of LGBTQ activism uh, in this area. I'm saying unfortunate, not because there's anything wrong with it, on the contrary, but because the growth of that discourse and its visibility happened to coincide with a period that many people, uh, many politicians, but also average people, you know, sort of living in these countries, uh, at a period that they're experiencing as a, as, a, as a period of loss of anxiety economically, especially, you know, even though they'd become part of the EU and now they're supposed to be doing better economically because there's more access to education, the labor market, goods, and, you know, everything's great except it's not, right? So at this period of looking for external and yeah, internal it, enemies, it, it, sorry. Except, it, except it's not uh, uh, for, many people even as it is true for some people right 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 right, right. so so yes you're also talking about the a, a kind of polarization internally yes. uh right. in terms of economic opportunities that have to do with education that have to do with age uh you know where in the your life cycle you're caught at that point right, right. um and so uh in search for explanations and for internal enemies, uh, in addition to the external enemies, so globalization, which who is globalization? Um, and those darn right. immigrants, oh yes, yeah, somebody can point towards. Then you have gay people like, oh, okay. So here's this new problem that we have, um, which of course is not understood in any kind of systematic fashion because there's now a like, sociological studies that look broadly at, you know, what percentage of the population self-identified this way? What does it mean that they do? None of that is part of the what's happening. What's happening is that churches, the Catholic church, but on, not only the Orthodox church, I, I, I see anti-genderism as being this place where the Orthodox and Catholic church has finally found a way to reconcile <laughs> after a thousand years of, you know, gosh, uh, it's sad, you know, but, mm. but, but what happened was that both of the religious leadership of, of these um, denominations found in the writings of people like Gabriele Kubi, uh, who's German and mm -hmm. Catholic, and who was being propped up by uh, both the previous and the current Pope as, you know, a, a, a morally upright, totally uh, appropriately verbalizing anxieties of the Catholic Church uh, scholar. She's not really a scholar, uh, but okay. Um, so her work got translated into a whole bunch of East European languages. People started reading it and started picking up on this language about gender ideology, identifying that with queer theory and with LGBTQ um, activism. Uh, and of course, without any kind of uh, self-reflection on what religious dogma is with regard to gender norms and whether that itself is not the gender ideologies that we've been living with for you know thousands of years at this point um so that was a way to deflect basically a, a kind of critique of other things that are not working they were taken out by politicians because you know uh it was an easy way to again deflect any kind of tension from one's own ability to 
engage with real problems in real time, right? Uh, so I think it gained purchase because of these var variety of, of, um, of factors. Um, and it's become, you know, in, in some ways, a dominant ideology in, in places like Hungary and Poland with regard to the ruling parties. Um, and in Romania? In Romania, not so much. So, okay. so the interesting thing in Romania is that uh, two years ago, there was a big, big move to have a national referendum against the, against the definition of marriage in the constitution, which right now is between two individuals uh -huh. without gender. Oh, my. Uh, that, that seems well, to have been an oversight. <laughs> it certainly was. Thank God. <laughs> and so... The Coalition for the Family, which is basically a group of, you know, the Orthodox, uh, the Pentecostal, and uh, several other um, evangelical groups, which receive a lot of funding from the United States. Right. There's a lot of that going on, yes. by the way. That, my, my friends in Poland point that out in, uh, about the movements in Poland as well. Yeah, yeah. Right. Judith yeah. Orbi, right? That's uh, yeah. the organization that gets yeah. all their money from. The, yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah. So that even with all that help. Uh, the preferendum, uh, because it was supported by and then the ruling party, Social Democrats, this is very complicated and illogical, but the Social Democrats are not real Social Democrats in Romania. They're just a mafia party that's really corrupt and they take care of their own. They decided that they're, the Social Democrats are going to be the ones that side with the Orthodox Church against uh -huh. gender justice. Logical? Not. Who cares? Yeah, yeah uh, well, you know, the logic, this kind of logic is a prejudice of people like us. It's not right. uh, how the political world works. For, for sure, for sure. Yeah. Uh, and But unfortunately, it didn't work for them either, or fortunately uh -huh. oh, yeah, for yeah, us. Uh, so the Social Democrats, you know, uh, organized this referendum, and they had to get 30 people, 30% 30 of the population out for the referendum to be valid, right? Mm -hmm. So the propaganda on the side of the referendum was done by the social democrats and the orthodox church mm -hmm. like the social democrats going to church on sunday and telling people the family is this a man a woman and their kids biologically born kids and these people are trying to turn your kids gay that's mm -hmm. you know the same thing as in poland and um and basically because the social democrats were so unpopular at the time the counter uh -huh. argument and the counter strategy was it's Sunday, stay home. Mm -hmm. So fewer than 30% went out. Uh -huh. It didn't pass. What's happened is that the people who are really vocal for the referendum then, 2018, have now transitioned to being part of this new political, um, in part, political party called AUR, which means Golden Romanian, the Alliance for the Union of Romanians, which is like, it's, it, it checks all the boxes. Mm -hmm. Misogynist, homophobic, anti-Semitic, uh, xenophobic, um, gee, I don't know what I left out, um, but they've got all of them. They check all those boxes. And so um, that's the new phase in which we're entering now. They want 10 percent uh, of the parliamentary seats in December. It was a big shock to everybody. And they want those seats at the expense of uh, parties that are pro-EU and that are some of the only parties in Romania that actually uh, really do care about gender justice, uh, mm -hmm. PLUS and USERE. So that's not good news. Right. right. Yeah. So, so uh, uh, how are we doing for, uh, we've been talking for- um, We have 10 minutes. Yes, we have more, ten, only 10 minutes left. So, <laughs> so, so we, should, we should be paying attention to the questions. The chat, yeah. yeah. Lala, you wanna help us with that? Hi, yes, definitely. Hi. And uh, hi, <laughs> thank you so much. This was um, infuriatingly uh, fun. <laughs> um, we have until 1 p.m., just putting it oh, out there. Okay, oh, um, sorry. No, 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 it's okay. Um, but we do have a few questions and I will start, actually Anne-Marie commented um, just uh, regarding anti-gender ideology, which is clearly supported and financed by the Holy See and the US based Christian uh, evangelicals plus supporters in Eastern Europe, Russia. Given the ethno-nationalist groups are um, hypersensitive about external influence, feminism is of often alleged to be an external idea. It is ironic that people not bothered by the external origins and financing of anti-gender ideology. So I just wanted, yeah. 
it's it's one of the things that I like to bring up every time that I talk about it. The fact that gender ideology uh, is very much what the Christian dogma of all these churches that support it is that it is gender ideology a so if you're going to be anti-gender ideology what is that bode for the christian churches as well you know as well as the fine the 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 kind of uh gray or shady financing that goes to these movements yeah for sure and we have a I, I, i've i've always I, been kind of in um puzzled about how these various nationalist authoritarians uh, could actually create a united front. So, I mean, there, there's something going on in the world uh, uh, and we Americans know it well because uh, we've played a vanguard role in it, uh, a, a turn to a new type of authoritarianism and involved is uh, nationalism uh, yeah. and uh, in virulent forms. And it, it does seem that uh, therefore, because they're nationalistic and because national interests uh, conflict with each other, uh, that it can't be an effective global movement. But in fact, there is this global movement uh, th that um, you know, certain um, uh, kind of fundamental themes. So a new one now is this anti-general uh, gender ideology. An old one, is anti-Semitism. It's always been convenient. It always strikes me as I, I'm bewildered uh, uh, when I come across anti-Semitism in the political life of, uh, of Japan. You know, I think, what the hell? You know, you know okay, there's anti-Semitism without Jews in Poland, but there once were Jews in Poland. Uh, there's anti-Semitism in Romania, but, uh, but uh, Jews and the relationship between Romanians and uh, and Jews is part of the Romanian story, but it, you don't even even have to ever have to had Jews. So, so it, 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 it's um, it, it, I, I think that anti-gender ideology is play, it is now fulfilling this this role. You know, it, it, it works so neatly because and conveniently you have women and uh, 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 um, um, and variety of different genders and people with various sexual orientations everywhere. So it, it, it kind of solidifies the, uh, uh, the unification of the dark, uh, the unity of the dark forces. I, I, I think that's... Uh, uh, so I wanted to add to one... Note. I wanted yeah. to add one thing about um, these external groups and the, the transnational sort of networks that they're part of. Um, uh, so if you look up the World Council of Families, um, this is an important uh, place where a lot of these actors come together. Um, the funding that they receive, I, I'm still kind of trying to figure out where it's all coming from because of the way that finance laws Right. are in this country and protect these kinds of so-called religious and so-called non-for-profit um, networks. But it's very clear that this particular organization has been active. Um, something like, I think, eight out of the last 10 meetings that they've had, uh, global meetings of, the, of, the, of this network they've had, even though it's established in the United States, have been in Eastern Europe. Mm -hmm. In Eastern Europe. Not right. like, yeah. Right. So there's been one in Italy and mm -hmm. one in Germany for reasons that, you know, might be obvious in terms of the politics of the Catholic Church, et cetera. But the other ones have been in Eastern Europe or Russia. Right. I, I think, you know, there's some things to be said about how, how this circulates and, and sort of where the yeah. focus is of all this attention. Yeah. Uh, and in terms of the internal kind of issues of uh, that you're raising about uh, thinking about the kind of internal enemies, you know, and this is a, a some kind of an external threat that's become internalized through the adoption of these gender ideologies, right? So one of the things that I'm doing and others are doing, and we had an, this lovely event uh, with Agnieszka Koszczanska last mm -hmm. um, Friday uh, with you, two Fridays ago, uh, oh. was is that we're trying to also uncover as much as possible the roots um, of 
feminism in this area. There are deep right. and very interesting roots. Uh, there's transnational feminist networks in Eastern Europe that were made up of conservatives, socialists, uh, liberals, peasantists all mixed together and working together for about 10 years to develop a joint agenda and best practices. This is uh, the women's, the, the women's little entente is what it's called. Mm -hmm. um, so those kinds of stories to me are also about really trying to understand where we're coming from and that these traditions that we think are not ours yes. are in fact ours. Right. It's okay. just a matter of which direction you want to look at and what sort of stories you want to privilege. And that's why I started with like, there's three women in Romanian, because that's really important to me. It might seem like, well, I'm individualizing. It's not. It's what memory of one's own kind of identity you grow up with as a kid uh, and, and what, who you look up to. My friend Colin is asking a question uh, about, <laughs> hi Colin, um, about what translation has to do with, uh, with, the, with what's happening with anti-gender um, issues in, in Eastern Europe. And you talk about Butler as, uh, as easily misread and caricatured by native speakers of English. Um, well, I don't know what to say. It's hard to it's it's hard to generalize about that. Um, so, for instance, Butler is read and is cited and is discussed in um, you know some of the gender studies uh, work that I know. Uh, for Romanian, uh, I've seen some treatments of Butler in Romanian, more more of it in translation in English. Back you know, kind of speaking to an outside audience. Um, but the language of so sort of queer uh, studies that um, is relevant here that I, I think you might be signaling to uh, is one that has yet to gain purchase. Uh, and I think here um, also about just the use of vocabulary, right? So, so for this discussion of pronouns, which in this country has arrived at a point where you know, there's many, many articulations and positions on it. In Romania, I think I'm one of like maybe 10 people who has been writing for 10 years, begging, and I'm answering the first question from Chris Robo here too, begging people to use the appropriate gendered uh, pronouns and endings to gender nouns and pronouns appropriately. Um, in languages like Romanian, you have three genders. Um, the languages that have three genders uh, have their own challenges about how to engage with queerness or with gender appropriate, um, you know, language and and thinking through categories and in, in a in a way that makes visible all these varieties of uh, self identity. Um, but the response has been, uh, in Romanian case, the Romanian Academy has these rules. The Romanian Academy is ninety two percent male. The Romanian Academy has zero women historians and zero women philosophers and zero women social scientists on it. So if you're asking yourself why things are not changing, I just gave you the answer. Uh, I actually have fights when I publish in Romanian and I, and I have to write every time. If you do not use the gender that I'm giving to these nouns, I'm no longer your author. Uh, so like for instance, in Romanian, professor, the, the masculine, right? Is the universal for university professor. And if you say professora, feminine, she cannot be a university professor. She's gotta be a teacher in high school or uh, below. That is how it's used. So I refuse to be called professor because, you know, I do self-identify as cis female and there is, a, there is a noun out there that can be used. It's just people refuse to use it. And they think, oh, you're just belittling yourself. I'm not. Um, that's the level of trying to educate people that we're talking about, you know. And in relation to the use of president, you know, to the feminine for the, for the Moldovan president, uh, here's the thing. As a historian, I have discovered and it's very easy to find out that if you go to books from the 1920s, when women really start to publish a lot and they become present in a lot more professions than before, duh, right? Uh, they 
use the feminine. Even for military uh, descriptions and self-descriptions, not oficer, the masculine, oficera. It was used in Romania in the 1920s. Nobody cared, nobody corrected them. All of a sudden now, we can't use the feminine for some reason because the Romanian Academy said something. So um, that is, I think, part of the problem we're, we're engaging with is a, as real resistant at the very top to even pay attention to this as relevant. Um, we have a somewhat related question to what we were talking before about this importation and external, um, and it comes from Juana Popa, and um, they're asking about how the Romanian diaspora could get involved uh, and contribute to the dismantling of the anti-gender ideology and uh, within the framework of many US educated Romanians who come back are seen as you all know, as westernized and abandoning their culture when they bring up these conversations and topics as being, you know, brought from the West. Yes, I know, I feel you. <laughs> That's what I said. Me too. <laughs> Been there, done that. Um, so the way I engage with it, uh, I mean, I, I, I don't purport to have a broad idea about how each um, category of knowledge makers or, you know, whatever diasporic uh, folks uh, can um, contribute to this. But I think that um, especially since you talk about going back to Romania and engaging with the society there, um, that insisting on having conversations about these issues in the Romanian context and asking the hard questions and, and really, again, back to the, what Jeff was asking earlier, you know, why, why is there no progress being made or how can it, we need to sustain public attention to the issue of gender injustice. Um, there are specific areas that I think are really important to talk about. Uh, domestic violence is an area where, you know, there's legislation, Romania adhere to the Istanbul Convention, but when it comes to funding from the government, and especially, this is the key thing, sex education, folks. Uh, we don't have enough of it in this country, there's even less of it over there. And so if we do not educate parents, uh, law enforcement agencies, judges, judges that think that a girl who's 10 years old and has an IQ of, you know, basically a person who is mentally handicapped because she was wearing a short skirt, she was not raped by the gang that raped her. She gave consent. This is the level of lack of education that we have in Romania. So I think any kind of um, friendly, sort of uh, inviting conversation about what these categories of injustice mean and how they affect real people and how the structures reinforce them. Um, and just simply explaining, you know, what consent means. Uh, what does it mean for a girl to, you know, be wearing a short skirt? How does that in any way provoke uh, anything? And how does that justify any sort of violence against her? I mean, that kind of a conversation that needs to be had over and over and over is the stage we're at right now. Uh, so that eventually your average citizen starts to demand different behavior and different attitudes and different policies of the people that represent them in parliament and in the government. That's not happening right now. People who are self-disclosed sex abusers, perpetrators, a guy who was raping women in his office of the National Liberal Party got reelected. What's up with that? You know, so, um, so I think any kind of discussion about these things where you also have statistics now about the frequency of these types of activities and what's done or not done or made it. Any, any kind of light that you can bring to that um, through your own conversations with others, I think would be welcome. And if you're interested in finding out more about the, the work that's being done, you know, um, if you look up the work of Juana Baluza, uh, she is uh, she writes a lot. She's got a blog with Ada Verl. Now she's got a uh, a TV show. Uh, 
uh, Natia, uh, General Natia, uh, of course in Romanian, Natia is feminine. Uh, and so she's drawing attention to you know, structural gender issues, gender injustices uh, from that perspective of sort of irony about, about the nation. Um, and Filia. Uh, is a non-governmental organization that's been very active. Uh, the organization ALEG uh, is important uh, in terms of bringing together uh, LGBTQ activism with activists for um, the, um, victims of domestic violence. So there's, you know, there's this places to go. And um, if you want to contact me after this, you know, I'm. You can Google me or just look me up. M B U C U R at indiana.edu and I can give you more, you know, information and, and more writings on this. There's materials out there. So there's, oh, go ahead, Lala. Right. Is, there, is someone else? I was just saying that I don't see any more questions right now, but uh, I would encourage people if they have questions to place them um, in the Q&A at the bottom. Okay, so, 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 so I, I, I'm, um, we've discussed the distance between um, uh, uh, feminists and people who are systematically studying problems of gender uh, and public actors, you know, and politicians and the state. Um, I wonder about uh, the kind of more um, local for, for us uh, academics uh, uh, matters. So how, uh, um, you know, do the problems that uh, you and Lala have in uh, uh, discussing these issues with colleagues from Romania um, uh, have to do with your friends and family or it, it, is this also with colleagues in the academy? Like what is the, what is the status of gender studies uh, in relationship to, uh, history departments, sociology departments, literature departments, the univer universities as a whole. In Romania, obviously. In Romania. Yeah, yeah. yeah okay, yeah. okay. Yeah. Um, well, the history departments that I'm familiar with are some of the most conservative uh, places to work when it comes to any kind of gender analysis. Uh, at the University of Bucharest, uh, there are several people who have interest in, have taught on, have done work on, um, I would say more women's history than gender history. It's more like add women and stir, you know, as opposed to a deconstructive version of thinking about political systems, et cetera. Um, those people, you know, were not hired to do this and they don't really focus on that. Um, they don't mm -hmm. train people in that area. They, it's like their part-time hobby. Mm -hmm. They're not gonna get tenure on that. Right. Um, in social, yeah. That's so, always a very big problem, what yes. you get tenured on. Right. Uh, so there is also um, the marginalization with regard to that. And for so, you know, I, I talked about Juana Baluza. She teaches, uh, she's got a doctorate degree uh, from San Esteban, gender uh, studies, and she teaches in a school of journalism. Mm -hmm. And uh, trying to get into... Um, the curriculum and to really, you know, shape a basically, you know, feminist uh, journalist sort of uh, core uh, has been a big goal for her and really important. And actually, there's some success in that area. If you look at, you know, how some of the uh, news media has started to right. sound and to talk a little differently. But as far as colleagues in the department, again, she has to do it. She has to fight for it. At every time that she wants to teach a course in that. The idea is not that other people are taking interest in what you're doing and they want to be in dialogue with you. If you work on gender history or in gender analysis in the journalism school, you're kind of, you know, the little orchid in your, you know, little potted plant there and just do your own thing. Don't bother us. Uh, it's okay if you bring prominence to the department, but don't make me teach that way. Right. Um, I think in uh, political science is a little different because there's more of a school there, as I was saying earlier, right? Um, that's somewhat the case in sociology as well. I think um, the kind of, you know, 
data analysis that is being done in any sociology program today and the kind of questions that are being asked of people who want to publish anywhere outside of you know Romania or go to Congress right. is demand that gender be a site of analysis or a category of analysis. You can't get away from it, really. Right. So I see it as becoming much more um, well articulated there without necessarily a feminist perspective, without necessarily a feminist analysis, but it is present, right? right? Um, and literature. I would say literature is the place where um, there's been more room for um, exploring not just a um, kind of liberal version of uh, gender analysis, but much more so um, the you know postmodern approaches to understanding um, gender um, identity and, and gender relations, gender power relations. And so there is where I've seen uh, much better articulated analyses that really now verge into uh, doing queer studies uh, in, in, the, in, in these, you know, English literature department or American studies department. Right. I know in Poland, that's the case yes. at University of Warsaw, right? Mm -hmm. And I think Colin, my buddy Colin, who's been on the call, uh, was one of the people that had traveled to Poland to do work in this area a few years uh -huh. back. Yeah. Okay, so it's, uh, I'd like to kind of circle back to our announced uh, 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 focus or theme, you know, not the subtitle, but the title, uh, if I'm, you know, about democracy and, ge and gender. Yeah. Uh, and, and um, I, I, you know, the, the essay I wrote was, um, uh, which is an article that I wrote in the early 1990s, responding to the introduction of uh, feminist thought to uh, colleagues in, uh, in Central Europe. So like the initial uh, moment. And uh, uh, when I was thinking, that was a response to Anse Natal. And Anse Natal, who, who was uh, you know, a great uh, feminist thinker uh, and uh, activist in Central Europe, the founder of uh, the Network of East uh, West Women, a really very distinguished person who unfortunately has uh, died too young. Uh, and, uh, but you know, she and I had a debate, democracy versus feminism, uh, uh, part of our Democracy and Diversity Institute. It was inspired by um, the fact that she and I were teaching in the same program. I was teaching a course you know, on democratic culture or something like that. She was talking, teaching a course on gender and feminism and uh, some guys, and they were guys, uh, thought that I was teaching the serious course and they thought that her course was uh, a joke. So we um, had, um, and of course I had great respect for her. So, so, so we had a debate about the uh, kind of the pursuit of democracy uh, uh, as an end in itself, and the, the pursuit of uh, gender justice, and um, and priorities, and I, I have to admit that that as a student of Hannah Arendt, and uh, I give, uh, and not only that, uh, uh, I think that the that it's crucial to actually cultivate a space where democratic interactions can occur, uh, even if there are injustices. So that to some extent, you want to separate the, the two, and uh, um, um, that's not the only thing I think, but that's something that that uh, was part of our discussion. And uh, Anne's position was there can't be any democracy without gender justice. The idea of democracy without gender justice is um, an impossible, you know, is an impossible idea. And uh, I always thought that the truth of the matter was actually in the discussion, uh, not in one position or the other. Uh, uh, but as the years have gone by, uh, the cogency and the power of her argument uh, has become to me more and more compelling. You know, that history has revealed that her part of the argument, not that it's the only part, uh, sound part, but that uh, we see that in the movement for democracy, 
if uh, um, uh, gender justice isn't part of it, uh, uh, you know, gender injustices are injustices are major obstacles to the constitution of democratic life. Uh, so uh, I'm wondering what you think about that. <laughs> you know, you're shaking um, your head. Maybe you just agree, and that's the end of it. But well, I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> I, I pretty much take. Anne's position here. Um, right. I would say one more thing, which I think goes to your last remark, and that is um, gender injustices are not just injustices for those people who immediately suffer them because they are the ones who are being directly discriminated against. Right. They are suffered by the entire society. Um, the kind of approach to pronatalism that the Romanian government took during the communist period, turning women into birthing vessels. It affected them very directly on a daily basis uh, in ways that are really traumatic um, for years to come. But it affected the whole society. It affected their families. It affected the places where they worked. Uh, it affected the ability to have community, to build trust. Democracy is based, I think, primarily on a foundation of trust that we can trust to be represented by the people that we vote for, that we trust them to understand us, even if they don't look exactly like this. If you are proven that that is not the case again and again and again and again and again, you lose trust in it. And I think that is the core issue that we're really talking about here, right? But also that Basically, if you're not able to see beyond your self-interest, this is the other side of that, right? Mm -hmm. In terms of how you vest yourself in this relationship to the larger community, that it's, if it's not just about you and it's about others around you relationally, then you really have to pay attention to these kinds of social injustices that are based on a socially constructed and culturally constructed categories. The notion that, I mean, this is not about, you know, cancel council culture, if you're not with me, you're against me. But the notion that if it doesn't affect you, you still want to legislate about, for instance, action to uh, access to reproductive, uh, you know, um, control, right? But you're not thinking about the effects that this legislation has on the bodies and the psyches and the development of those people as part of the community you're not doing your work. You're not doing your work. And it's, it's, it's as simple as that, you know? I think it's um, still hard to talk in those terms, though I'll be perfectly honest, with certain generations of people who grew under, up under communism. I think that's one of the challenges in Eastern Europe. Um, right. You know, generations that are younger, people who were born, you know, in the 80s and beyond, they have a different relationship with this right. notion of collective uh, identity or right. collective trust. Right. And that's the hope. I mean, that's where I think there's opportunity. Yeah. Uh, the important thing is not to keep harping back on all the evils of communism and construct, because that's the other thing we haven't really talked about, construct democracy as equivalent to anti-communism, which is right. a very strong trope going on everywhere in the bloc now. It's become stronger, in fact, in the last mm -hmm. five years. That really bothers me. That is cancel culture. I mean, if there's anything in Eastern Europe that looks and sounds and walks like cancel culture, it's this anti-communism is the way forward. Because if anybody who's studied what anti-communism meant in say 1941 to 1942, 44, it meant fascism. Right. And it still means that for a lot of people. Yes, yeah, yeah. No, no, uh, look, I, I uh, wanted to raise that issue because I, I wanted to kind of highlight the uh, context, the, the broad normative uh, and political context that our discussion uh, actually uh, exists within yeah. uh, and, and at the stakes to underscore the fact that the stakes are just so, so high. And, um, and I thank you for your, your response. Uh, uh, but you, and you 
uh, uh, reminded me uh, one other thing I wanted to talk to you about, but maybe you, you addressed it. Uh, uh, and that is I was interested in the gap uh, between academics, but also between generations. So, 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 so um, uh, um, I'm, uh, a, I don't like the talk. I was listening to a radio program the other day where people were saying, you know, what are you know what are the baby boomers responsible for you know were they good were they bad how how do, do uh, us gen that's a bunch of bullshit you know uh, you know uh, generations are more complicated than that than to say you know to imagine that they're agents uh, in this way but as uh, uh, worlds of experience generate you know people being born at a certain time have common experiences and, and I'm wondering, you know, talking about, you know, uh, hopeful and disheartening developments, whether you have, uh, how you appraise the, the, uh, uh, the generational differences uh, when it comes to the issues of democracy and gender generally uh, and in Romania. Um. It's very hard to speak generally in terms of right, 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 right. generations, yes. uh, as you said. <laughs> yes, uh, so what I can speak to is a work that, again, that I referenced earlier about um, three generations of women that Mihaela and I interviewed for our, our book, Birth of Democratic Citizenship. And one thing that was really um, apparent and we did not expect but once you think about it, you kind of makes oh yeah makes sense. Is that um, the women who grew up in the sort of pre-communist or early communist period tended to have um, a more positive appreciation of communism as something that had eliminated mm. problems, limits in their own lives, and that widened their horizons and made their life easier. Why? Well, we talked to women who were. A, from the countryside, right. B, from small cities. These are people whose lives were really hard before yeah. communists came to power and who had very little access to education and all of a sudden things got better for them. Um, these are not radical feminists by any means. They just, they saw what was happening in their lives and they recognized it. Their daughters, the generation that grew up in like mid-communism and were like in their thirties when communism ended, uh, not so in love with communism, not so in love with communism. Why? Well, they grew up doing the hardest part of communism, had to deal with the anti-abortion legislation. And that was not at all an aspect of their lives that they wanted to talk a lot about. But when they did, it was very traumatic, clearly. Um, and they also saw communism as um, being a bunch of promises that were not fulfilled. So that's their position, very critical. And in terms of the post-communist period, seeing the opening of uh, you know, more opportunities as maybe that, but at the same time, seeing serious problems or neoliberalism as, as something that has destroyed community in, in, in the way that they had experienced it, interestingly, in opposition to communism, right? So there's that too. The earliest generation, the youngest generation, those who were like 10 in 1989, right? Um, took democracy for granted. Of course, this is how it should be. But at the same time, did not see it as something to be fighting for. Uh, they were the one group who, when we asked, if you could just depend on uh, money that comes to you from your partner slash husband, would you still work? Like we asked that question of all of them. The previous two generations were like, we don't understand the question. Of <laughs> course you work. That's what we do. That's what right. people do, right? Yeah. Younger generation were like, oh yeah, that sounds good. Yeah, yeah. So uh, generationally there's that, you know? Uh, there's also the issue of, of course, access to media, access to information, being mobility that, you know, might sound like privilege. Uh, and it is in many ways, if you think globally, but within the European context, you know, mobility for people who could not get passports before, could not go anywhere beyond maybe, you know, Bulgaria, and now can go work, can go travel, can go study anywhere, has really shifted. And again, I mean, this is not like a universal sort of people become more democratic because of that. No. 
there's a much bigger diversity of perspectives that people are exposed and they come back with, which sometimes translates into xenophobia, homophobia, et cetera, and sometimes translates into wanting to really be connected to the European wider networks of knowledge making profession, et cetera. So it is in this case, very much class, I think related, um, and also urban uh, rural split. The, the things are like Romania is still 50% rural now. Wow, that, right? that's impressive. Poland is 38%, I, I yeah. looked it up. Yeah. Um, and half of Romania's urban population lives in Bucharest. All concentrated in really one place. Right. Now, like in Poland, when you have you yeah, know, 20, cities. 20 yeah. cities that are over 150, no, 200,000 inhabitants. Right. So it's it's different sociologically in that sense. Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, this was very, very interesting. Uh, and uh, uh, I thank you for an illuminating conversation uh, and for deepening our relationship, our friendship. So, so uh, it's another step, uh, uh, and someday, somehow, we'll uh, 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 we'll meet again uh, in person and not be via Zoom. And I hope it, it's not only you and me; it's also <laughs> uh, uh, the the other participants in in, in this seminar, uh, in this webinar. Uh, uh, this is a pretty neat format, so that uh, you can be in Indiana. Indiana, uh, Lala is in Romania, I'm in New York, and who knows where uh, the participants are from, but I'm sure all over. Uh, but it will be nice uh, to uh, meet again uh, after the pandemic in person. I have to say that reminds me one question I had for you, which I'm just gonna leave unanswered, is uh, how does the pandemic uh, uh, kind of make more complex everything that we've spoken about up to this point. So uh, maybe that's the topic for another webinar. I know you've actually written about it. So, so uh, 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 thank you everyone, uh, especially thank you, Maria. Uh, and and um, um, I think Lala, do you have, did I see you put something in the chat about our upcoming events? Do you wanna say something about that? Yes, I shared a lot of good information in the chat. So if people want to say it before leaving, it's our upcoming event. Um, as uh, Jeff pointed out, um, our next one um, is actually um, April 21st to the 23rd. It's a memory studies conference, um, suspended present. Um, and um, the next event is in, uh, in May and it's a, a book talk with um, um, uh, with Claire Potter on her new book, Political Junkies. Um, yes, that's going to be interesting, May 5th. And um, Cassidy Gardner says, thank you, Professor Maria Bukur Deckard. And thank you, Jeff and everyone. Okay. Um, yes, so please save the chat and we will email um, the video from this event to, uh, to everybody when it's, uh, when it's ready. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, thank you Lala. Bye-bye.